Hey guys, welcome back to Cult of Film. Truman and I are back, and today we are talking, uh, a, a, obviously we try to talk classic films, uh, bangers, but this one, really, if you haven't seen it, this is a absolute masterpiece of a, of a thriller, of a suspenseful, intrigue type of film, and it is anime. It is, it's one of those films that is so good that I figured out multiple generations are aware of this movie. Like this movie dropped in the 90s. I remember seeing it in an art house theater in Chicago back in the day. And it's stuff that like people in their 20s today know this film. This is the great Satoshi Kon, who sadly passed away a few years ago. Uh, who, If you know anime, you know Satoshi Kon. I think this is his best film. Uh, and we're talking about the masterpiece that is Perfect Blue, which I believe was 1997. Uh, just a real, real piece of work. And this is something that uh, uh, Truman and I have been wanting to uh, talk about for a long time. He's seen it a bunch. I've seen it a bunch. He has, he has to have a poster behind him in previous episodes of Perfect Blue. And that's when I knew I'm like, I'm doing this with the right guy. So I guess without uh, further ado, um, Perfect Blue, Truman, what were your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's such a it's a very big question. Um, right. Yeah, this is like a top five movie for me. I really, really love it. Um, yeah, and anyone who knew me like in in college knew I was like, you know, this is like one of the movies that I could not just just could not shut up about. But um, essentially, it's a it's about this pop idol in the '90s, and for for people who don't know what a pop idol is, I guess it's people are more knowledgeable about the, this sort of thing now because mm -hmm. uh, problems of K-pop um, in the United States. But it, it's essentially that where you are, it's not just a, a pop musician in the American sense. You're kind of mm -hmm. become this character that an agency or a music company manages um, and they kind of have complete control over your life and image mm -hmm. uh, about this young this young girl named Mima who's a pop idol um and working for this you know kind of a small-ish pop group with two other girls um and you know they're they have a following but they're not they're not like super stars um but you know they're, they're in kind of a sustainable place and her agency decides that she needs to make the leap to being an actress and quit being a pop idol forever, you know, become a, a serious actress. And in doing so, um, she essentially kind of angers a section of her fans and um, she begins being stalked by one of them. And there's a series of mysterious murders. Mm -hmm. um, and throughout the course of the film, she kind of begins as the agency changes their image. And as she tries to become a, a different person, she begins to lose sort of a sense of who she is. Um, she kind of film. starts to dissociate, not just, it's not just the, the change in her career and the change in her image seems to affect her psychological state and her sense of her identity as, as a person. And she mm -hmm. sort of begins to dissociate, right? Exactly. Yeah. There's and there's a there are a lot of very surreal, um, very visually, um, I guess, inventive sequences that kind of really make use of the the medium. But um, yeah, it's just a really fantastic film, one that I love. Uh, so, Kyle, what are what do you like about this movie? There's there's a lot to like. Yeah. Uh, one, I, I I like one. It's a sophisticated film. I think it's again it, in the '90s. I don't know how. It was more of a cult film in terms of it, like it had a following and those of us that loved it and were into Japanese culture. And like you said, understood the concept of the pop idol, which we have pop singers here, but it's not quite the same thing in Japan. Like you said, they have the, the, the companies over there have tremendous control over everything that the talent does. And in many ways, it, all, it is entirely manufactured. Um, you know, it's, it's true of J-pop today. It's true of K-pop today. Um, that a lot of these things are are manufactured, and so they don't have a whole lot of say in, in in who they are. And so what I think is so brilliant about this movie is, it's sort of what happens when okay you're the one making the money. Granted, they sort of 
created you and developed you, you know, what happens when you want to do something else or they tell you to do something else? It's, it, there's a lot of questions about what do I want and who am I? And that psychological uh, aspect of it to me is very reminiscent of one Hitchcock. I always said that you know at the time that I watched this movie, I was I was also really into Hitchcock films and suspense films. I'm like, it's this is like Japanese Hitchcock, really. You know, uh, what the fact that it's an anime film might push people away, and it shouldn't because it's it's really, despite the um, very sort of surrealistic aspects of it that pop up, it's a very grounded film. It's very sophisticated. It's very smart, and is really compelling. You really you're pulled into this woman's world, Mima, you, you, and you, you sort of stuck with her. Like you want to know what is going on, what is happening. You've got the intrigue of the obsessed fans, you know, uh, which I think people can relate to, especially in the social media age. It's even, it's even more that, you know, when a talent or someone does things that, you know, people don't like, they will turn on, on them. And so this was sort of, um, I guess an early precursor to that. Cause there's, there's in the film, there are uh, chat rooms, because again, it was the 90s, dedicated to CHAM, which is the girl group that she was a member of, and you know people that are talking about what she's doing. And so it seems like everyone has an opinion on Mima, on this woman, and she's sort of lost psychologically, spiritually about, you know, what, what do I think? What do I think of me? What do I want? And so it's very, to me, it reminds me of Hitchcock. It reminds me a lot of like early, um, uh, Brian De Palma, who you know did a lot of, was heavily influenced by Hitchcock, certainly in his early years, and because it's this was this was 1990s feature film uh, level anime. So again, it's still completely hand drawn. You know, we're not like one of the things that pushes me away from the contemporary stuff is so much of it is computer generated, uh, which I understand because to hand draw things is it's really laborious work but it does take me out and you know going back and watching this film i'm like oh my god this was all hand drawn but because they had the massive feature film budget you know it wasn't an ova wasn't a tv show and obviously the anim the animation in those days you could tell the difference um mm -hmm. sometimes it wasn't as smooth throughout a series but in a feature film just gorgeous gorgeous animation which really heightens it I love feature film anime. You know, I'm I'm of the generation where you'd watch an entire animated anime TV series, you'd watch the OVAs, the one shots, and then once you got to the movie, you know, Ron the One Half, the movie, um, Inuyasha, the movie, and yeah. you get to things and it'd be like, oh shit, you know, like you know, the first Dragon Ball Z movie. Uh, it's like okay, and you could just you could see that they had more money, they had this budget, so everything was as bigger, the scope of it. And so, yeah, I, I will always watch, you know, like any pre-2000 feature film anime, I'm in because this is the quality of it. Um, even I remember seeing it at an art house theater in Chicago, seeing, you know, sort of the negative scratches or, or whatnot really yeah. added to it. And, and I, I love that. But this film is it is really suspenseful. It's intriguing. It keeps you guessing. Yeah, again, the surrealistic aspects of it. I don't want to give too much away for those that haven't seen it. It um, it keeps you thinking. I like films in general that I can't predict. There's so much stuff that's made today that you can see the beats. You can see you. Oh, I know it's kind. I know she's going to go in there and he's going to pop up. You can't really predict this film, so it it's it feels like a real ride. And again, without giving too much away, the resolution is absolutely again masterful satoshi Kone was really at the height of his powers when he did this movie and he all his movies are great tokyo godfathers paprika but yeah. this one in particular i don't know this one is my favorite of his yeah i haven't seen tokyo godfathers um but i had seen all of Kone's other stuff uh, and i agree i think this is those are all also really great too but i think this is right. out of everything is really um his, his best form. I think, yeah, again, you know, this is one of those movies where just everything about it just works so well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really tough to kind of, I love every single element of the film. It's kind of tough to pick a place to start, but I think one of the 
the big things for me that you kind of touched on as well is like the ways in which this film is very prescient um and in many in many ways very forward thinking um, relative to sort of how modern society is today you know, there was kind of a spate of films in the late 90s. Perfect Blue is one of them. Uh, the Truman Show, another banger. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one as well. Where there, there's kind of this inkling about how the way people relate to entertainment, the way people relate to celebrities uh, changes, you know. And, and Perfect Blue is really about the ways that people develop these kind of, these very toxic relationships with, you know, the people that entertain them, people that right. they have never met in person, they develop these strange obsessions. Um, you know, the people there's oh, since Perfect Blue was released, the word like parasocial was invented to describe people who have this toxic and almost like deranged and diluted relationship to celebrities. And right. you know, in the nineties, it's one thing. Um, it, it's it's one of those things where you watch Perfect Blue and then. Think about how the world was in 97. And mm -hmm. then you go on Twitter and you see people who are like obsessed with Taylor Swift and Beyonce and BTS and all these things. You go like, holy shit, like they, they, they ain't seen nothing yet. Right. Um, and I think that's that's one of the best kinds of movies where you you watch it and you go like, holy shit, this was this was spot on. Like this is how right. the world continue to evolve mm -hmm. and this is this is this is exactly this is exactly where we are and they were they were so right they didn't they don't even know how right they were right um, no, it, no it, you said no Ab prescient is absolutely the word you know you know you, there's no way we could have predicted back in 1997 1998 where it was going like, it, it so it so gives you a glimpse of what social media would be and how that would change the relationship with audiences to their favorite talents and again, what I think is one of the things that really draws me to this and makes it not just, because I feel like there's there's so much anime out there that isn't sort of grounded in a human experience. And that's yeah. what makes much of it. It, it make, it's difficult for me to, to watch a lot of the new stuff for the reason. Not to say that I don't like wacky, fantastical stuff because there's there's a lot of stuff out there. It's I Once we got, I think, past maybe 2010 and just a lot of it just lost it for me, uh, the appeal. but. Perfect Blue, there's there's a there's a bunch of movies that do this, but Perfect Blue in particular gives you like if you don't if you never really considered, and of course we know this intellectually, but it drops from the mind kind of down into the heart into the body. That, oh right, these people are human beings. Like right. Beyonce is a human being. Like you know she's an amazing talent. She's you know BTS. You know they're they are the, the these super talented, beautiful, rich people. But they are still people, and there's so many parts of Perfect Blue where you see Mima just trying to hold it together, or she just wants a quiet moment. She just wants to, uh, like, almost like press the pause button. Like she wants to make. I just, you could tell, even with even if the lines aren't there, she just. This is a woman who just wants to make some decisions for herself, and everything, that, you know, everything that's built up around her really is not allowing her the, the the fandom isn't allowing her the management the company the director the producers she's sort of locked into this thing and she's not um she's sort of like being pulled along with it and mm -hmm. it, it's just really um and, and for and obviously she's a young person being a pop idol it and you know it's like i was watching this at a time when you know, as a young person uh not to say that i'm old but i'm older than i was but you know, somebody who was—I saw this in my teens, and I think early twenties—and that's a time in your life where you're still figuring yourself out, yeah. and you think that oh, these people who are celebrities and have all this, you know, fame and money, and they can do anything. It, I remember it being one of those films where I'm like, ooh, you know what? I don't, you know, I don't know that I would ever want to be famous. <laughs> it's one yeah. of those films. Like, okay, depending on what it is, I mean, so much of it can be manufactured. It is a job, and it's, 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 it's real flesh and blood human beings that have feelings that deal with stuff. And this is one of those films that sort of covers all of that, but it does so in such a beautiful, stylish way. 
again, some, some surrealist elements thrown into it, the intrigue, so many of the, so much of this film seems, if, I rec if I'm recalling it, is, is, is sort of uh, occurring at night. You know, she'll be shooting, you know, you, you'll have her, at the very beginning opens with her and her girl group going out to uh, do a performance. So it starts there, and then after that performance, they are immediately talking about, it's time for you to transition, you need, you need to do, you need, should be acting now, this is the next step. And so you have the daytime where it's sort of like, okay, this is very sort of normal, doing business, but once we get to nighttime, that's when it's almost like the world starts to close in on Nima. You know, she's, she's alone in her apartment, she's alone in the tub, um, she's going on to the the, the, the chat groups and the, uh, the the chat rooms, and it's it's very sort of claustrophobic and, and lonely at night for her. You can tell that that's you start to the layers are sort of peeled away. What's it? Wow, this poor woman is not in control of anything in her life, and you know it's obviously terrifying. That's sort of like the horrific element of it, the psychological element of it. But it's so beautifully done. Every frame of this film is so perfectly composed. You know, there's no, you know, um, it just, it feels very throwback. It feels like Satoshi went back and was watching Hitchcock films. That he was watching all of these things from like the 40s and 50s, but he transposed mm -hmm. it into something that still feels modern. Uh, the palette feels very noir as well. It almost, I would say that even though this is a sort of horror drama, I feel like this movie might qualify as a neo-noir. What do you think about that? Yeah, I could definitely see it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of genre overlap with it. Um, and I think, yeah, like you've, you've pointed out, particularly from like a directorial standpoint, there's a lot of stuff um, as far as shot composition and, um, yeah, shot composition and framing goes that really contributes to this um, feeling that is very reminiscent of Hitchcock, um, where you just constantly kind of feel trapped in claustrophobic, like you said, claustrophobic the entire film. And right. the film does a really great job of placing you um, in a kind of sympathetic position where you begin to feel kind of claustrophobic too. There's a lot of scenes where, you know, Mia will just be like, like walking down the street and she'll start to feel paranoid you know, in a subway, you know, and it's this kind of irrational fear that um, is weighing on her, but, you know, she's kind of constantly on the verge of a panic attack. Um, right. And you kind of feel, feel that way too. You're, you're right there with her as she's experiencing this. Um, and I think that's part of what, that is one of the things that this film really succeeds at is it has that very visceral, um very unsettling feeling um and the the music in particular uh contributes to that as well a lot of the times um there's this one track in particular that's just this kind of like droning very ominous um tones and um you know some some kind of like pounding drums and it really is reminiscent of this feeling of being in this high pressure situation where you're trapped, you know, and you, you have no idea how you're going to get out of it. Um, right. And that is the feeling that you get throughout the entire film. Um, and it's great, you know, because it, it works again, it, as a film where everything works, it works on that emotional level, but it's also really um, thematically and kind of like intellectually satisfying too, because it, again, it's about, so much of these things, so much of it rings true. Um, and it's about these kind of like bigger ideas as well. Uh, like you mentioned about kind of identity and this notion of like, who am I? You know, you're trying to figure out um, who you are as a person. And part of the problem with being famous is that everybody has their own conception of who you are. Right. Um, everybody has um, something that they want to get from you. Mm -hmm. um, no one is really coming into these interactions in kind of just uh, an honest, genuine way. And I, the notion that Perfect Blue really gets at and what it's, I think, ultimately about is this, this question of like, well, if there are all these different versions of you out there that people have, and there's this notion of who you are in kind of like the general public eye, then, you know, who's to say that that isn't 
actually you, you know, who's mm-hmm. to say that the you that you think you are is any more real than, you know, the thousands and millions of other versions of you that people have out there. And, I think, and the question ultimately asks is, you know, if there's all these different versions, you know, is it possible that the you that other people think about could then take on a life of its own and then become almost like, you know, supplant right. in a way as sort of the the real the real person. Um, mm-hmm. And that's I think, a, a very terrifying concept. And again, something which is um, very reminiscent of, of Hitchcock and reminiscent of a lot of other classic. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically the premise of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's it's one of the big questions that's come up, you know, recently. There's a lot of social scientists studying social media, like how, like one of the things with social media, it's kind of your life, but with all of the sadness and hardship and struggle clipped out. So mm-hmm. it's sort of like, you know, if there's somebody only knows you from social media, they only know this sort of like fraction of you, which is you in a way, but it's a very curated form of you. Um, one more thing. Brian, we need to pause here for a second because my fucking dog needs to get back in the room and he will not stop barking. So I'm going to go get this dog. Can we just pause it real quick? I'm going to make a point. I will come right. I just wanted to try to like let him finish and let me finish. Give me one second. Get him out of here. Come on. God damn it. Boy. Boy. Jesus. Fucking Christ. Sorry, guys. Anyways. Got a really fun tidbit that will, um, yes, I love you too, but I hate you right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, we'll, so, we'll come in. so, yeah, just call me in. And, uh, another thing about this movie that I realized, I remember wondering about it like years ago, like, I mean, a long time ago. And I thought about it this morning. And I never, I didn't realize, I'm like, you could just Google this. Like, I couldn't, back in the day, I couldn't Google it. But I always wondered, why is Perfect Blue called Perfect Blue? Mm. I think in any of the reading that I've ever done about this movie, any of the reviews that I've watched on it, commentary, no one has ever talked about, what does the title mean? So I'm like, you know what? Okay, we, we've got all this at our fingertips now. We didn't have that back in the 90s uh, or the early 2000s necessarily. So... I looked it up and I asked, why is the film Perfect Blue called Perfect Blue? And as someone who's seen it, this will really, this will ring true. And it's, again, another layer that Satoshi Kon puts into his film that, again, just sort of reminds me of his genius. The use of color in Perfect Blue, in the title of the movie, blue can refer either to the psychological state Mima falls into, which she's literally feeling blue because she's not really in control of, of her, her life, her career, or to the meaning that the color has in Japanese culture, which the, 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 the type of perfect blue color stands for purity and the female energy that a Japanese idol tries to project. So it's sort of like this idealized pure woman or pure young girl. And that makes perfect sense because that's basically what idols are. I can't think of a, a single idol singer that is like a bad girl or uh, a rebel. It's always a very genuine, pure, good girl type of image. And I think that's kind of what using, like, I don't know if this movie would have worked if he would have chosen a woman in another profession. The fact yeah. that it, it, you're dealing with a woman who is an idol singer, who, who represents culturally within Japanese culture, or even, you know, even, within um western culture you know pop idols um have it's 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 always an innocent young girl up until like i guess britney spears but um (laughs) but so it it makes even more sense and then what ends up happening to her and this sort of this nightmarish journey she goes on is that much more powerful because she is pure she is innocent um and sort of you start to see that sort of whittled away because she's made this decision to do something more. And again, the, 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 the people that have so invested in this sort of pure, almost Virgin Mary-esque aspect of, of, of the idol that she, she was, uh, you know, again, people get upset about it. And it's, again, to your points about the level of entitlement that fans have toward their favorite 
you know, celebrity singer, rapper, whatever. And when those things change, it's just, again, it's, it's a really interesting thing. You know, I, I don't know that I've ever, I couldn't think if I've ever been like a mega fan. And I, I, I've been like a mega fan of certain talents. I wouldn't say there's a ton of people out there today. Um, I feel like half of my idols are dead. <laughs> All my, half of my favorite directors are dead. Um, you know, I'm, I've been watching a lot of like exploitation films and I'm like, man, these people, like, I mean, I love those films, but it, it was a shame that a lot of these people didn't get the opportunity to do more because they were really capable, really good. Um, but yeah, I, I can't think of a time that I ever got, I'm trying to think if I ever got mad at something. Maybe Kanye, you know, because he's one of the biggest sort of hip hop talents to ever come out of Chicago. And in recent years, he's kind of lost his mind, you know. So, you know, maybe that's it. But, you know, Kanye is certainly not a pop idol. But uh, yeah, so those are those are some things that I don't know come to mind with this film. Uh, any any other points or, or any other tidbits or anything that come up for you in this film? Because yeah, again, you've watched this a bit more than I have, and this is one of my favorites. I will watch this anytime I find it. But are there, are there things that you've noticed re in recent viewings that maybe you didn't when you first saw it, or anything else that you feel like to note? It's, it's interesting that you mentioned Kanye as well, because I think he is also someone who's emblematic of the ways in which fame and other people's perceptions of you um, can really negatively impact your mental health and cause you to kind of, you know, spiral out of control. Right. Uh, and, you know, these these notions, again, another another good instance of how this film is repression. You know, when you add things like social media to the fire of stardom mm -hmm. um, it really it really can just just have a brutal toll on these on celebrities minds um, yeah and it, it's you know that's i don't think there's any better example of that than, than kanye west and right. that that's something that that really interests me too because like you said before it's like when you're younger fame and and all of these things seem very appealing but mm -hmm. um you know once you start to realize what what that being famous actually entails and the way that your life is no longer yours, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's a really tough realization to come to. Your life is fundamentally changed. And the problem is once the cat's out of the bag, you know, you can never not become famous again. You know, you right. can maybe eat from relevancy, but people will still know your face and you can kind of right. never have to like, peace again in your life which is just awful <laughs> right but, right um, one of the things that i think is also that perk blue does really well as well as it shows the more realistic less glamorous side of celebrity uh, there's the obvious stuff like you know um, being stalked and having people around you be murdered uh, which isn't great but you know the more mundane things as well it it, it takes a lot of time throughout uh, its opening sequence to show us Mima just going about her day and mm -hmm. realize it is this very mundane thing. You know, we we cut between um, Mima performing on stage uh, and her going about her daily routine and getting getting milk from the store and yes, realize yes. she's mm -hmm. her refrigerator has gone bad. You know, all these kind of like small mundane little things, um, but it it contributes. You know, these these moments, they're not vital to the plot, but they contribute so much to not only her character and sort of the themes of understanding that these celebrities are still real people who are very vulnerable uh, and not too different from us. Um, but it also, it does so much for the world and making it feel realistic and fleshed out. Like you pointed out before, you know, there's not a lot of, well, I don't want to say not a lot, but in general, it animates. It's uncommon to have a film that is kind of just set in the regular world. That right. nothing fantastical about it. You know, what is essentially just a straight up drama, or in this case, you know, kind of horror thriller. Right. Um, like this, dude. This could have easily have been a live action film, and yeah. all the beats, everything would work. You could do all of that, and all the stuff that happens in this film, you can do in live action. And I, I'm always, as someone who likes sort of dramatic anime, stuff that isn't fantastical, 
I'm always, I always think it's cool that they chose to use the anime medium as opposed to shooting it uh, in, in live action. There's, there's something to seeing, like you said, the grounded sort of real world, the mundane things in an animated style. Because you, you don't see that. You know, you see Dragon Ball, you see Inuyasha, you see One Piece. You don't, th yeah. you don't see a woman going to the grocery store, buying milk, and taking a bath. You know? And that's something that is, uh, I think, fairly Japanese in many respects as well, you know, this kind of mm -hmm. emphasis on the mundane. Um, that's something you see in a lot of uh, Japanese films that uh, we should talk about at some point, too. But sure. um, the, yeah, I think it's it's these little details, again, which are not explicitly necessary for um, the plot uh, that form kind of the heart and soul of the film and it's what makes it feel so richly detailed uh mm -hmm. so and it's one of the the main one of the big reasons why you know i've watched this film so many times uh because there's it has this it has such intricate and very specific uh detail that allows it to ring true and it grounds the rest of the kind of more fantastical action um and it, it helps you feel centered and and it it's why the film doesn't feel overblown and kind of cheesy, right. you know, because you have these moments. Yeah, like even like one of the things I've always loved about uh, about anime uh, is their willingness to like when you, you have a scene where somebody's in an office and there will be a close up of them typing and you'll look at the computer and you'll realize, oh, I've seen that computer like the computer looks real, like the level of detail down to the letters on the keys. Um, mm -hmm the 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 floppy drive uh inserts all of those things uh i've seen uh, you see because the japanese love apple products are you know for like the past 30 years i've watched yeah. anime where you can see the apple symbol on some products and things so yeah. that level of detail or you know even in um even in other um you'll see brand names pop up like there's a there's a scene in you you have to slow it down tremendously or pause it there's a scene in uh, the Macross film, you know, the Super Dimensional Fortress Macross, which is a, it's a staple of anime, and when people say they've never seen it, I'm like, you aren't an anime fan. They did a feature film of it in 1984 called Do You Remember Love? And there's a scene in it, like, throughout the whole movie, like, you've got them in sort of the city that's on the ship, you've got Honda uh, in the background, you see Coca-Cola, you see all of these different McDonald's, all these brands uh, pop up, and I, I, that level of detail Again, that's it's a very Japanese thing. Like there was yeah. no product placement for that film, but they wanted to make it feel more real in that space where people lived. So they had those things pop up, and yeah. you know, Perfect Blue does this. I think you see like a, a bottle of Pocari sweat in the supermarket mm -hmm. when it's shopping. You see these identifiable brands. I think, if I'm recalling correctly, but it just looks so real. And again, I don't think of all of the animation that I've seen, you the Japanese seem to do that the most and it, it grounds the work in a way that uh, I don't see most other productions do. And so it's another thing I love about it. Yeah. And I, I think even beyond one of the things that I, I like about this as well is that, you know, it has all of these, these details um, and the kind of like intricate minutia and, you know, the like, very granular specifics about how the shots are composed and you know, how different sequences are animated. Um, but like in terms of the like broad strokes of the narrative too, this is just a great thriller, you know, like it, oh, it's yeah. so oh, absolutely. Engaging, so tight. It's like an 80 minute movie. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, and it's just engrossing too, you know, like even ignoring, and this is how we feel the film as well. It's like even ignoring all this kind of, these kind of like hoity toity big ideas and, you know, kind of more granular filmmaking focus, you know, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just a really good watch, you know, yes. like it, it's so engaging and exciting. Um, and I feel like that's something that, you know, we shouldn't forget about. Um, when thinking about movies and filmmaking as well, you know, like that having this be. Well, yeah, you know, if you're, when you said tight, that is one of the most perfect words to describe it because it's 
it feels longer than it is. Like you said, it's like mm -hmm. what, what, eighty minute movie, like however long. It, yeah, it's, so it's, it's, it's not. It's not long. It's not like it, it feels like it could be because there's so much detail. There's so much that he packs in. There's so much that he establishes so yeah. well. You think this is a two and a half hour movie? No, it's not. I think it's. I think you're right. I think it's under ninety, and. Like you said, it sort of grabs you and it pulls you through, and it's just fun. And that's something else too. Like we've reviewed some movies that are, you know, um, like World on a Wire. You know, that's yeah. two, that's two ninety-minute parts, um, yeah. but it's worth the, it's worth the ride. But then it you is. watch like Perfect Blue that establishes so much, that builds so much character, that builds a world, and it does so so efficiently that it sort of proves that you don't really have to. I feel like sometimes some of these movies is, might go on a little longer than they need to. Um, and, and again, Perfect Blue is efficient. It's a fun watch by the time you get to the end. I mean, I, re I was thinking about this movie the first time I watched it. I mean, I was thinking about it for months and months afterward. I just, I had never seen anything like it. And that's why, again, you're right. A taut, tight, fun thriller. You're wanting to see where it goes. And it, it's, um, no, you know, we like a lot of heady cerebral stuff. And yeah. while there's a little bit of that in there, I don't want people to get the idea that it's it's a heady film. It's not. It'll make you think, but it is yeah. it is pure fun. It's a really great watch. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and dude, I yeah, I, I won't say it. I, I don't want to spoil it, but like the right. last I don't know if you remember, but the last shot and the last line of the film, uh is one of just like my favorite endings to mm -hmm. a movie. It's sure. just such a killer way to finish it. It's so simple, you know, like everything mm -hmm. else with it. It's so simple, it's so minimal, um, and it accomplishes so much. Oh. Like every time yeah. I watch it, you know, even even after having seen the movie like 15 times, every time I watch it, um, she says a line, let me get the, the answer, I'm just like, oh, yeah, that yeah. was... Six. Yeah, well, again, it, it, and this is yeah. it's, it's one of those movies, again, why it is a masterpiece. I, I, I really wonder, and again, it breaks my heart that he's not around um, oh, anymore yeah. because he was so good. And again, all of his work, all of his work is worth watching. It's, it, it, but Perfect Blue for me, it's, it's kind of like, again, not to say that his other work was less, but there's something about Perfect Blue that, like I said, like you said, it's in your top five. You know, it's it's certainly in my it's I would say I put it in my top ten films of all time, but it's definitely in, in terms of I would have to section out to like anime films. It's definitely in my top five top five anime films of all time. Like yeah. you you have to you know in terms of things Japanese, you have to read all of Akira, all six volumes before you die. It's one of the most amazing oh. artistic experiences, most transcendent ex artistic experiences of my life. Oh, but films wow. like Perfect Blue, films like Perfect Blue are are a true experience even if you're not you know cinephile nerds like us that sort of like dig into like you said the minutia and the granularity even beyond that even if this isn't you don't like psychological thrillers you will love this movie it's just it's because it's just so good whether you like the genre or not whether you're familiar with japanese pop or not i've yet to introduce this movie i've, I've shown people this movie that hate anime and they're like yeah. whoa um, you know, and they're they're really impressed. Um, sort of transition. Yeah. We like to we like to do this in terms of, um, and this will be interesting. Uh, films that would be an interesting double bill with this film, uh, and there's one that's really glaringly obvious, I think, uh, and another a director that I also really really a, a guy who does work that it's like you can tell he's making films for himself first. Um, I think a good pairing double bill with Perfect Blue would be uh, Darren Aronofsky's Black Swan from 2010. Yeah. And for obvious reasons. Yeah. This movie was heavily, clearly heavily influenced by Perfect Blue. I only saw Black Swan maybe a few years ago for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching this movie and there's parts of it that are, and this is not, this is not a, Critique or in any type of insult, Darren Aronofsky, because I love Aronofsky. I love the wrestler. I love Mother. I like. I like what he does. Um, yeah. But there's like almost he almost reproduces parts of Perfect Blue shot for shot in Black Swan, and so I'm watching this. I'm like, oh, 
he really loved Perfect Blue, or he's a big Satoshi Kon. And I don't mind that because I'm a huge Tarantino fan. And I've gone back and watched as much as I can of the films that Tarantino says that he loved and that influenced him. And you get to see him straight up stealing shots. Oh, and I was, I have no prop. I have no problem with that at all. I think you steal from the best. Um, you wouldn't have had Oren Oshii in Kill Bill without Lady Snowblood. You know, Mako Kaji from the seventies. I mean, straight up borrowed it. Cool, and, and, and you know, retooled it for his own purposes. So, in no way is this a criticism of Aronofsky. But Black Swan is sort of, in so many ways, it is a a, a almost a live action version of Perfect Blue. It, it's its own story. It's its own thing. It's about a ballet dancer. And, uh, Natalie Portman is amazing in it, but mm -hmm. it's it is its own film. It, this is it's Aronofsky writes films and directs films that you could tell when he does them. It's like oh, he wasn't thinking at all about what do they want, what do they mm -hmm. need, what would they like. It's like I'm going to do this. This is interesting to me, and that's what I'm doing. And yeah, Black Swan would be a great double feature with uh, with Perfect Blue. And yeah. one, other, one other comes to mind. I don't know if you're familiar with it. If you're not, it, it's, it's, it's been streaming. There's a, a movie from 2021 filmed in LA called Take Back the Night. And it's, it's about a woman, uh, a woman who finds herself a victim of a violent uh, attack and sort of launches a campaign to get justice. I don't want to give too many other details other than, uh, because she has a particular history uh, of, and I, I guess I can reveal this, she has a history of some drug abuse and some mental illness. And because of that, people are questioning her attack. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where like there's levels to it. Like if you've ever been through something and people didn't believe you, or you had knowledge about a person or a situation and you tried to confide in people and they're like, you're just making that up. You know, it's, it's uh Again, to that, like, okay, is it, am I crazy? What's going on? So again, that would be another great sort of pairing with Perfect Blue because of uh, obviously the main character, Mima, questioning who she is, what she's about, what she wants. And, and the main character in Take Back the Night is, is that as well. Again, like Natalie Portman's character in Black Swan, it's, it, it's so much of it gets very existential and very, you know, really, who am I? And it's, it's all three of those films are really fun. If you like Perfect Blue for those reasons, Black Swan and Take Back the Night, uh, I would highly, highly recommend. Right. Um, I would say, yeah, I mentioned it earlier too. Uh, and also some obvious bias here because I like talking about this movie as well. But The Truman sure. Show I think is also very, right. has a similarities to perfect blue like i said before you know they both come at the, the turn of the millennium and they're about uh these notions about how we interact with celebrities and sort of the role that entertainment has in our lives and the way that people focus center their lives around you know tv shows and right. pop stars and all these things um and the, the social media element of it that you don't even have to be a celebrity now that yeah. it, it, in some, I, I like, I, I really envy my friends that have no social media, you know, depending on what you are living, you know, you don't necessarily have to have it, but a lot of this, like, you know, we talk about films, we're in the film industry. We, you know, we write, we do these things. It's, it's kind of hard to not be on social media. So in a way we're all sort of becoming Truman in, in that respect that it's, it's sort of like, we all sort of, everybody has a camera on their phone. Like it's it's really difficult to be in any way sort of anonymous these days. Yeah, and that's again, you know, it's one of those things where you look at it and you go like, oh, like my God, you know, this is this is correct. This is this was how things turned out to be. Um, another one, I think, uh, another yeah, good comp would be Solaris. Um, in the sense that it's also about this, the notions of identity and, you know, who am I really? And, mm -hmm. you know, am I the real me? Um, and what even is like the real version of me? Um, all those questions. Well, we, will, and we, will, we, will, we will be reviewing the, uh, the original Solaris by Tarkovsky from 72, 72, 73. No, that's another one that, you know, obviously it's not 
all about that, but it's got that it's got that very prominent thread through the whole film of of, of a character that's really dealing with that. And that yeah, your good call. That is that's a brilliant movie in general. Like I'm a Tarkovsky nut. I worship at his altar. I think everybody should watch all of his movies. I think he's I personally think he's the greatest filmmaker that ever lived. But yeah. uh, Solaris, yeah, Solaris would be an interesting pairing with this again because it does deal with existential what's well, russian so it has to be existential so the existential themes but you know, that, that one particular character in solaris that has that identity uh, that identity crisis i guess we could call it and so beautifully done good call good call um yeah yeah, yeah those are those are the prominent ones like i suppose maybe to an extent maybe like any of the invasion of the body snatcher movies or, or remakes but i think to a lesser extent because though again the the creatures that take you over you just kind of become you know you're not you're not uh you don't have thoughts and feelings you're just sort of like a blank slate after they absorb you or whatever it is that they do but no those are yeah truman show solaris black swan take back the night i think are good companion pieces to something like perfect blue um I was trying to think of maybe another anime feature or um, there's only one that I can think of. There's only one anime that comes to my mind that might be a nice follow-up to a viewing of Perfect Blue. And it's not a feature. It's a 55-minute OVA from, I think, the late 80s. I saw it. I rented it from Blockbuster as a kid. And it's, it's Rumiko Takahashi. Those who are in anime know she created... Ranma one half, Inuyasha, Urusai Atsura, um, lots of stuff. Like the woman's a genius. And in the late eighties or mid eighties, they did something called Rumic World, and it was a series of like four OVA standalone stories. And the best one to me was something called The Laughing Target. Yeah, I believe it is. It's been you can watch it free on YouTube. I believe right now. I pulled it up like a year or two ago. And it is still one of my favorite spooky, so not just spooky anime, but just spooky stories. I just I think it would make such a it would make such a great live action film that I'm shocked that no one's ever done it. And it involves teenagers, it involves young people, it involves you know young love, um, but it's also kind of a ghost story at the same time. There's elements of identity in there as well that are, are grappled with. And again, it's it's only it's it's less than an hour. Again, beautifully executed. It's so efficient. Like the, what they establish and what they get done. Again, you'd swear you were watching a much longer piece. But yeah, the laughing target. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Highly, yes. highly recommended. A nice follow up to something like Perfect Blue. If you if you want to stay on the anime track. Again, those other live action films are great pieces too. But uh, per anime. Laughing Target. It's another one of those that I, I'm always shocked that more people don't know about it because I think it's one of the best spooky stories. Just period. Again, spooky anime, top three I've ever seen in my life. Uh, but spooky um, stories, period. Just, I'm shocked that it's never been reproduced in, in, in another way or if people haven't adapted the concepts because it's, whew, it's a fun watch. Highly recommend it. Uh, I'll check it out. That sounds great. Yeah, no, I think you you will you'll dig it a lot. I, I think you will. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if you, if you don't have anything more. I, I feel like I'm I'm good. Any more thoughts on on Perfect Blue? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say a watch the rest of of Cohn's stuff. Watch Paprika and Millennium Actress and Paranoia Agent and uh, Tokyo Godfathers and all of that. Um, you know. One Tokyo the, Godfathers actually just had a, a limited run. I think the, one of the Fathom events, I think recently they did Co Tokyo Godfathers, which really kind of surprised me uh, because again, you know, I feel like Millennium Actress, Perfect Blue, Paprika were kind of bigger. Uh, mm -hmm. I was surprised Tokyo Godfathers made that sort of run, which it gives me hope for fandom. You know, when I see something that's more esoteric, uh, more not flashy, not, superhero-y stuff uh, in terms of anime, get that type of a big re-release. That makes me feel real good about the state of, of fandom that people are not just watching what's out now, but going back to 
these beautiful, uh, real, uh, you know, sort of tent pole masterpieces that really deserve to be watched. Yeah. And I, I would say, yeah, and this, this especially though, Perfect Blue, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, it is just one of those movies where, it, like, just everyone needs to see it. Every single person, I've shown this to like more than a dozen people, and sure. every time I've shown it to someone, they've just been amazed by it. You cannot go wrong watching this movie. It's a little dark, a little violent, but you know that's life. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, it, 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 it is dark. It is violent. It is also beautifully shot. It is beautifully composed. Every detail of this movie is just, you know, not to sound like a um, hoity-toity sort of pretentious film critic, but it is yeah. a delicious movie. It is a delicious movie to listen to. It's a delicious movie to watch. It's oh, it's just. Five out of five stars, man. It's so good. The music, the music is even good. You know, like the oh, the score is great because there's whole scenes where there's no where there's no score and no sound, and then there's parts where it's sort of almost all score and sound. And yeah, the use of the of, of sound design and the score, also just five out of five, man. Wow. Yeah, it, it's just yeah, fantastic, front to back, dance, it's tight, it's eighty minutes. You can do it. Right mm -hmm. now, watch it. Um, and yeah, I believe, I believe if, as at least as of this recording, uh, you can watch Perfect Blue if you subscribe to Shutter.com. Which, mm -hmm. if you're any kind of follower of this of this show, this this channel, uh, Shutter is the depth and breadth of horror or horror adjacent uh, films, TV shows, uh, specials uh, can be found on Shutter. Uh, there was. There was a, about a month ago, uh, I think it came up, maybe around Halloween, Criterion Channel had the Criterion edition of Perfect Blue on their streaming service. It's another one everybody should be streaming. Uh, but uh, and I think it popped up on Tubi for a short while, and right now I believe it's on Shutter. So you can find it. it it's, it's made the rounds. It's, it's only gained uh, an audience and an appreciation, so it's more widely available now than it's ever been. So it, it's relatively easy to find. Yeah. They just released a steel book for it too. Um, no kidding. Okay. Yeah, dude. I was in Amoeba yesterday, and I saw, I saw it, and I was like, I already have the Blu-ray, but right. <laughs> I, I want to get this uh, very badly, but I, I stopped myself. But maybe I'll trade something in. Um, but yeah, so that's it. Good stuff, man. Go. Good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, this no. I, I'm glad that uh, you pushed to, to do this one early because I I forgot how impactful this film was on you know on me uh, coming up, and it's just it's only as I get older, I just with every viewing, I just appreciate it more and more and more. And this guy really raised the bar, um, not just on storytelling but execution. Jesus, so good. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Really, please check out Perfect Blue. Check out the the sort of like adjacent recommendations that we threw out there. We think about this stuff really hard and would never just say watch this. And um, yeah, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll hopefully do more Satoshi Kon stuff in the future. But thanks again, Truman. And um, yeah, we will see you all next time. Thanks for watching.